in our audience as well. Um, so I do apologize because it's January and I'm giving you the data for our fall. So the students, the kids came in looking at our fall data. Um, most of our winter data is in. We've been having our data reviews. Um, not everything is in Linkit yet for me to be able to pull out, but the data for the winter is done. It's just not included in this presentation as of yet. So just one quick thing, I know this this picture is a little bit hard to see, but it's something that we've been focusing on with the staff this year and in our admin meetings to remind us what our students have been through for the last 18 months in the school year. So taking a look in the left side of that chart, 
a student that is currently in sixth grade, their last normal, quote unquote, normal school year where they were in school for a full day for an entire school year was in third grade. And a student that's in fifth grade, it was second grade, a fourth grade student was first grade, a third grade student was kindergarten, and our kindergarten, first grade, and second grade have never had a normal school year. So I just ask that while we're going over this data that you keep that in mind because you will notice that we have more kids that need support and we have more kids that are in the emergency range in all of our student data across the board. So in the beginning of the school year when the kids came in for language arts, all of the students got the Dibbles assessment uh, for reading as well as starting in second grade, the quick spelling assessment and then I ready. And in math, starting in first grade right away, all of the students were given the math interview in grades K through one. So that's a one-on-one -on -one assessment that the math teachers sit down with the student. They have certain problems that they have to solve. And the teacher is assessing the mental math strategies that they are using to solve the problems. Uh, math reasoning inventory is what is given in fifth and sixth grade. The students are then being asked to take what they've learned K through four and apply those math strategies to higher numbers, also decimals and fractions. And they also take the iReady assessment. So once the universal screeners are given, we have a data review, we sit down and we look at every student's da data and we look to see if there's any, do we need more information to be able to know exactly where our students need their interventions. So if needed, if a student needs a phonological awareness assessment, we give that in grades one and two. Once we assess the kindergartners, that's also one of the assessments that we give them. Um, they are, receive a quick phonics assessment in grades one through six based off of the data. And then the math interview, they're given a full math interview or a leveled math reasoning inventory depending on their grade level. So the first thing we're gonna go through is, we're gonna start with language arts, and the two main assessments we're gonna take a look at is Dibbles and iReady. So we're gonna start with Dibbles. Um, just taking a look, we did not give the full Dibbles assessment in 2020. So the data that I'm showing you compares this fall to 2019, when we gave the entire assessment and there was a composite score. So in 2020, there was no composite score, we just gave certain subtests. Um, of that assessment. So you can see for kindergarten, the percentage of students that are intensive, which is your red, did increase to 57%. In first grade, we went from 26% of the kids being intensive to 49% of the kids being intensive. In second grade, 27% of the kids are intensive, and that increased to 43% of the students being intensive. One thing that we did notice when we dove into the data and looked at all of the subtests, phonemic awareness or phoneme segmentation part of the Dibbles is the key indicator for a student that would be struggling with reading as they, as they move through the grade levels. Our number of students that are intensive in that category are decreasing, which is allowing our interventions to move into phonics much quicker than they have been in the past. So I know the overall score looks a little scary when you're looking at 50% of the first graders, you know, being at the intensive range. Um, but diving into the data, the things that we are doing with the students, with our benchmark workshop phonics program and the interventions is working and now we can start shifting that into the phonics much quicker. In third through sixth grade, fifth and sixth grade, this is our first year of ever giving the full Dibbles assessment, so we don't have a baseline data, uh, area of data for them. However, when you look at third grade and fourth grade, you'll start to see, yes, there is an increase in the number of students that are intensive, but it's, it's a lot smaller than what it is at the lower grades. We are actually able to start shifting our interventions over to comprehension and fluency versus phonics in third and fourth grade. In fifth and sixth grade, I'm happy to announce that even though there is 28% and 32% of the students intensive, after digging into their data and looking at iReady, our interventions, we have minimal interventions at the phonics level, which is what we've been trying to do and accomplish for the last couple years. 
our interventions are moving more towards grade level focused skills, comprehension, and vocabulary. So moving into iReady Reading, um, this is our district from 1819 to the 2021 school year. So you can see that there definitely is an increase in the, in the red, two grade levels below, three grade levels below. Um, our one grade level below percentage has relatively stayed the same, as well as the early on and mid grade level. You'll notice a little bit more green in the 2021 school year. Um, please keep in mind that we were in a hybrid situation and many of our students took the assessment at home, which skewed some of the data. And they, we had kindergarten students that tested on a second and third grade level. Um, and, you know, it's okay, they're home and they're struggling and parents are going to help them. So just, take, just be mindful of that when we're looking at this information. Um, for this is each grade level. This is our school district compared to the national norm, as well as to the year to date. So that includes 6,775,000 diagnostic assessments that were given across the nation. And this compares us at each, grade, at each grade level to all of the other districts in the nation that are also giving the iReady. Um, if you can see my dot where it says you, this is us. So. Unfortunately, my eye always goes to the red, and <laughs> I always compare the red first um, and look at the green before I look at the green. But you can see that we're relatively performing just as everybody else is that takes the iReady assessment. I wanted to give you five years of iReady data because we have it in grades K through four, and I thought it was really important to take a look at where were our students before the pandemic where were they during the pandemic and where are they this year? Um, and I would love to say that this year has been a normal school year, but it has not. And it has probably been more difficult than last year, considering the number of staff that have been out, considering the number of students that have been out. So I don't look at this year as a post pandemic year by any means, um, but taking a look at that data you can see in kindergarten in 2020, there's a lot more green and yellow up there than any of the other years. Um, and you'll start to see that red grow in second grade. But being able to really dive into that data and take a look at it, we're really noticing in kindergarten and first grade, it's a phonics and frequency word issue, which makes completely sense, makes complete sense when you think of they've never really been in school before, some of them, even if they went to preschool, what kind of preschool were they able to attend? Was it virtual? Was it just a home, you know, a home preschool? So being able to look at that, they didn't really get that letter naming fluency, maybe learning their letters and their sounds. Um, in second grade, all of the subtest areas hover around 25% of our students being at two or more grade levels below except for in phonics, there is an increase. There's about 37% of the kids that were intensive in phonics, which makes sense, considering they really, they didn't have a normal school year in kindergarten or first grade. Moving into third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, you steady see that percentage of students that are two or more, more grade levels below um, increasing. However, it is the vocabulary and the informational text, subtests that are driving that. It's no longer the phonics, subtests of iReady, as it's been in years past. So I'm sorry for the board members that haven't been here, that haven't gotten to see um, the years prior to this, but our focus had always been on phonics, and now we're starting to see a shift in that. So this is the number of basic skills students that are in tier two and tier three. Um, in the gray, you'll see in 2020, in the fall, how many students were in basic skills. And over here is 2021, and here is, how, is it an increase or a decrease? Actually, in first grade, we're, we're below by four students, but you'll notice a huge jump in third and fourth grade. There's one reason for that. We had enough people available to help us provide interventions in third and fourth grade 
that we were able to be extra sensitive with the data and pick more kids up for fluency practice. So we separated them by who needs just fluency, who needs phonics, who needs comprehension, and we were able to bring more kids into services for third and fourth grade. I can tell you for the winter, um, there's not that many kids as we expected. If we could hit them hard in third, you know, at the very beginning of the school year by the winter, we would be able to exit a lot of the students out of tier two services. So just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, the Dibbles composite score, I know the intensive range has increased and this is gonna be our baseline data for fifth and sixth grade. Phoneme segmentation fluency, the percentage of kids needing the intensive intervention has decreased, so we have been able to move into phonics much faster. Um, the percentage of students scoring in the intensive range for nonsense word fluency has slightly increased in the lower grades, which makes sense. That increased because the phoneme segmentation decreased, so you're gonna to start to see that shift. Um, and like I said, in grades three through six, we've been able to provide interventions in oral reading fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension, and we're also able to use more of the iReady data when planning our interventions. The iReady data included five years, as I explained, um, in grades three through six, even though the percentage of students below level has stayed the same, or in some cases increased, we're seeing that turnover, that our interventions are now starting to catch up with grade level skills. Um, and the number of BSI, as I explained, I just wanted to make sure you guys had a reference to go back to when you're looking at the presentation. So to move into math, we are gonna go, and we're gonna look at the math interviews, sorry, number sense, the math interview, and iReady. So this again is iReady, and as you can see, there is an increase in the, no, the percentage of students that are two or grade levels below overall, um, looking at the last four years of our fall data. This is, again, is the same slide comparing us to all of the other um, districts in the state that also take the iReady assessment, and this one includes 7.7 .7 million diagnostics. And again, it's relatively on par with everybody else. Here, looking at iReady, again, you kind of see the same thing happening. Once you hit first and second grade, you're starting to see more kids in that two or grade levels below. They cannot be two or more grade levels below in kindergarten, so you'll never see it. They can only be the one, one grade level below in kindergarten. Um, but a slight increase in second grade, the shift that we're seeing is geometry and measurement and data being our area of weakness because the last 18 months when we had to go through the curriculum and we had to target and prioritize standards, those were not some of the standards that got prioritized. So the standards in numbers and operations and algebraic thinking were prioritized over geometry and measurement and data. So the data is consistent with, it, with exactly that. We're seeing increases in our algebraic thinking and number sense and decreases, or when I say decreases, um, more kids are intensive or emergency in the areas of measurement and data and geometry. And it goes across the board into third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade as well. Looking at the math interview, um, I started with first grade because kindergarten doesn't get it until November. Um, but in first grade, you can even see the students did better this year than they did the year prior at 76, being on level, on or above level. Last year, there was 74. Um, in second grade, there was a big jump. 65% of our kids were on level compared to last year was only 38. So definitely seeing some gains in the strategies that, are, that the students are using for number sense. In third grade, they take the math interview, but now it's with multi-digit numbers. So you can definitely see an increase here of 74% of our kids being on or above level versus 65. And then we also gave that same assessment to fourth grade. We typically wouldn't. We typically would give them the multiplication assessment and that's it. But because of the last two years and how school has been, 
we wanted to see where they were with multi-digit numbers before we moved into multiplication. So we gave them both. Uh, so fourth grade over here, there's a slight increase in the number of kids, went from 54% to 60%. And then in multiplication, which we were shocked, honestly, because, you know, look at last year in the hybrid situation in third grade is a critical year to learn multiplication. And 68% of the kids scored on or above level versus the year before at 58% of the kids. Now at Ritter, fifth grade, this is where that interview switches over to the math reasoning inventory. This assessment is much more difficult because now they're synthesizing all of the information that they have learned and all of the strategies and applying them to higher numbers. Not only higher numbers, but fractions and decimals as well. So in fifth grade, you can see our students, there is quite a bit of red, but we still did better. 35% of the kids versus 28 the year before for whole numbers being on or above level. And there was a decrease in the number of students that were emergency. A slight decrease in sixth grade when we're looking at whole numbers, fractions, and decimals. Um, but definitely more kids being on level than being in that at-risk stage as well. Here's the number of basic skills students. This was 2020 in the fall. This was 2021. And you'll see here every grade level increased with a number of basic skills students, um, but there wasn't a huge increase. I can tell you in fourth and fifth grade, the reason why there is an increase is because we have implemented a math intervention room. And I'm sure the new board members don't know what I'm talking about, but I know I, I've talked about it before. Um, prior to this meeting, the math intervention room where we are putting tier two and tier three students together, um, together and separate, if you will. And we were able to identify more students because we have a whole class designated for intervention. Um, I won't read this to you because it'll reiterate everything I already said, but just again, this slide is here so you can go back to it with, for your reference where our shift has occurred, you know, the shift that has occurred in iReady math is from numbers and operations and algebraic thinking used to be our area of concern that has shifted over to geometry, measurement, and data. Um, just the difference between the math interview and the math reasoning inventory there, in case you need that for reference, the number of basic skills students and why that has increased in fourth and fifth grade. Um, Yeah, even in first grade, I know that there was an increase of 14 students that needed basic skills for math, but when you look at the total number, it really is relatively low compared to what we expected to see this school year. Um, however, to give you an update, given all of the circumstances and everything that I've asked you to keep in mind, the district goal that you guys approved <laughs> We knew that it was going to be um, extremely difficult to attain. Um, and to give you an update, this is the, so we said that 70% of the students in kindergarten through sixth grade will attain the following percentages of their annual stretch growth in ELA and math using the iReady. So we tiered the students and here, the students in tier one, each grade level, needed to meet 34% of the kids at each grade level needed to meet their stretch growth. We have one grade that did that so far. Fifth grade, 47% of the kids that were in this tier one met 34% of their stretch growth. Uh, you will notice for the tier two, nobody has met the goal of 27.5% and in tier three, Nobody has met the goal of 22%. Right now, if we had to say what was our achievement of our goal, it's 0.05% of the students meeting their stretch growth. Down here, we don't have any, none of our grade levels have met, and this is for math, and so we, we are relatively at 0% of our students meeting their stretch growth. Now, we know that the mid-year diagnostic doesn't show a lot of growth from fall to winter. Our, we're, we are going to see the growth from fall to spring. 
but Mr. Walton and I talked, we brought Mr. Slavin into the conversation as well, and we wanted to be able to provide you with an update as it, as it stands right now. Start strong. So I'm sure all of you are aware that our students in grades four, five, and six had to take a state assessment this fall called the Start Strong Assessment. The students were assessed on standards from the, their prior grade level. Um, when we got the data, it gave us three, I call them buckets. Students put in three categories, some that would need less support, some that would need some support, and some that would need strong support. By the time we got this data, we, we were done with our universal screeners and our diagnostics, and we were already moving in and knew exactly who was getting their interventions and what we needed um, to do. However, you can see this is for language arts that when you go grade four, five, and six, and then as a whole, it, we're almost split into thirds between all three areas of needing support. And then here, this slide has the race, gender, um, and their program. So whether it's free and reduced lunch, 504, special ed, ESL, and general ed, the females and the males performed relatively the same, which we've historically seen that on our state assessments. Um, up here by achievement level, this is by race here. And then our free and reduced lunch, our ESL students. I don't think any of this data was a surprise to any of us, to be honest with you. This is the math data, so you can see there's definitely more of an increase in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade of the students needing that strong support in mathematics. And historically, in the past, when we've been able to dig into our state testing data, we have noticed that our students struggle more with conceptual mathematics than procedural mathematics. So that is something that we'll definitely take a look at, but it kind of goes in line with all the other data that I already showed you in terms of their already and what we were seeing at those grade levels. This will give you the same information up here as by race, female to male, relatively the same, and then by their program, ESL, of course, which makes sense, being the highest here, free and reduced lunch, 504, special ed, and our gen ed population. The sixth grade students had to take science because typically in the spring, it's our fifth grade students that take the science assessment. So there was a, definitely a significant number of students that fell in that strong support category. And again, this is by the race up here, your male and female, and the program. I'm done. Do you guys have any questions for me? Taylor. Yep, 
they're going to see all the standards in my writing uh, across the board to the vocabulary and comprehension for informational and
I want to put a ELA intervention work in, like we're doing for math, because we're seeing such growth in the students with their foundational math skills. I feel like we kind of flipped where we were for reading for so long, we were at that foundational level, and we're starting to build that up, and for math, we're at that foundational level, where we're not going to see the gains that I'm ready quite yet, but we're seeing the gains and the strategies that we're using strategies that are applying to and taking the mathematic abstract concepts and bringing them down to the concrete and working through the concrete stage, the portal stage, and abstract stage in a much more successful way. And they're making more decisions. So I feel like we have the staff, we just don't necessarily have the space. Um, The yes, it'll be in all schools, yep. It was first through sixth grade for round one, and now we'll bring in the kindergarten. And that's your target for two? Tier three students. Tier three. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, thank you. You're welcome. I'll leave this up for now and just take it down when you guys go to executive.
All right, I make a motion we come out of our executive session at 8.24, by the second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, uh, moving on with our agenda. Uh, the next item is a uh, nomination uh, for an appointment to the fill the board vacancy. So at this time, I'll make a motion to open the floor for nominations uh, for the board vacancy. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Those abstentions. Mr. Borelli, uh, I guess the floor is open at this time, correct? For I'd like to make a nomination. If anyone would like to uh, make a nomination uh, to fill up the board vacancy. I'd like to make a nomination for um, Michelle Boyle. Okay. Second. All right, we have a nomination uh, for Mrs. Doyle and a second. Um, are there any other nominations at this time? Uh, hearing none, I make a motion to uh, close the floor for nominations for the uh, board vacancy. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Um, any questions or comments? If not, I guess uh, call the roll on that, correct? Yes. Fellas? Yes. Uh, congratulations, uh, Mrs. Doyle. Uh, also, would like to thank the other uh, candidates for interviewing this evening. Um, I think uh, we all can agree. Um, if we had three more seats, we'd, we'd love to appoint all four of you. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, but I hope you you all stay involved and uh, consider running in the uh, in the coming election. So, any other comments from any board members on that topic? Yeah. Uh, if not, we will uh, move on. I have my school board president report, uh, which I don't have anything specific to report this evening. Um, NJSBA representative, uh, Ms. Caselli, she's actually uh, absent this evening with COVID. So uh, we wish her the best. Uh, I spoke to her today and she was doing, she was doing fine. Uh, however, she did test positive on uh, Sunday. So she didn't want to risk coming out this evening for everyone's safety. Um, moving on to approval of minutes. We have the minutes from our 12-13 uh, regular board meeting as well as our minutes from our 1-5 uh, reorganization. Uh, just caution our new members. They may want to abstain from any meetings they didn't attend. Uh, so at this time, I make a motion to approve the minutes as listed. Do I have a second? Second. Um, are there any questions or corrections to the minutes? Uh, if not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Any abstentions? Chris, Chris you abstain you from you the minutes? You abstain from the meetings that you weren't, weren't at. Oh, okay. So just say that you abstain. Abstain. Miss Doherty, I'm assuming you abstain from 12 well, that, that 13. Well, that's my question. Like, was I seated before? I don't think I was seated. No. You, so I have to abstain. Correct. Yes. From 1213. From 1213. But you were here on the. Uh, I was, yeah. I abstained from January 5th. Taylor's going to be on Tuesday. Well, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, Terry Lewis, we did ask this question one time, and she said even if you don't attend, um, you can go over everything, do um, the meeting, and the agenda just to have the um, approval or anything like that. Um, however, if you were on the board, you definitely can't. But, um, you know, that was. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely correct. Is that correct, Mike? As no, long as yeah. someone if, reviews the meeting, if they're uh, able to thoroughly review it. Right. Yes. Not sure why anybody would actually want to put themselves the through that, but yeah, you, you can. Would like to remove your your abstain, given that information. Obviously, it's still applicable for Chrissy and Barbara. I would like to remove that abstain. No. <laughs> Motion carries. Minutes are passed. Thank you. Okay. The lesson on minutes. Um, next uh, item on our agenda is our human resources uh, items. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Well, we did. We, we reviewed all of the items in the back, with the exception of the I nine, which was a policy for the reading. So we wanted to take a look at that. <coughs> Excuse 
excuse me, the um, policy committee weren't determined at all. It was our November meeting, I guess, that there was an outdated policy when we were reviewing the uh, school day policy. So this was updated, um, just identifying the considered essential employee for maintaining district operations on inclement weather days. Uh, really the review there was that uh, the inclement weather days are still work days for 12 employees. Uh, then I would make the determination of whether the uh, non, quote unquote, non-essential employees would be in person or working virtually those days. And then uh, we updated that, uh, that rather than they let us know by 6 a.m. they have to enter the day off in the system as we have done with the other calls. Really just a clean up. Any questions from anybody? Uh, if not, I make a motion to approve human resources items I-1 through I-12 as recommended by the superintendent. Do I have a second? Second. Any comments? Uh, if not, if you could call the roll, please, Trish. Cunningham? Yes. Doherty? Yes. Pedroso? Yes. Dean? Yes. Trace? Yes. Bellis? Yes. Frank? Yes. All right, moving on to uh, education items. Um, yes, yeah, so there's only two items, uh, J2, J3. Uh, J2, we have a school-wide um, student-driven book donation. And remember, we did this activity last year with second grade. We collect um, gently used books, and then uh, we donated to Craig's the Crowns. And then we have a few out of district workshops to approve. That's really it for education. Anyone have any questions? Uh, if not, I make a motion to approve education items J1 through J6 as recommended. Do I have a second? Second. Any other comments or questions? Uh, if not, if you call the roll, please, Trish. Fergoso? Yes. Keene? Yes. Trace? Yes. Bellis? Yes. Cunningham? Yes. Dory? Yes. Bray? Yes. Motion carries. All right, uh, general administration. General I've had stuff, all normal monthly stuff, enrollment and attendance, uh, discipline tables there. Uh, we discussed the items in the back. Emergency drills, and again, all, all monthly, normal monthly stuff, our COVID information. That's on our tracker. That's, that's it. Any questions? Uh, if not, I make a motion to approve general administration items K1 through K7. Do I have a second? Second. Any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, uh, please call the roll, Trish. Bellis? Yes. Casella? Sorry. Cunningham? Yes. Yeah. Doherty? Yes. Fergoso? Yes. Keen? Yes. Trace? Yes. Frank? Yes. Motion carries. All right. Uh, operations? Operations is also slightly like uh, typically at level one, claims and payroll or as normal as anybody need time to go over the bill lists or have any questions on the bill lists. Seeing so none on the phone. Item two is the budget transfers for the month of November 2021. Item three is the budget over expenditure certification for secretary report and cash reports for the month of November 2021. Item four is also for the month of the month of uh, November 2021. Cafeteria report for the month of November 2021. Item six, we have one out of district student placement as listed. Seven is none, eight is none. Item number nine is the transportation contract as listed. Rolling through down to number 14 as the others are done. Get the revised meeting dates as discussed in the update. Item 15, Wilson Supplemental Services as listed. Item 16 is the carryover and amendment for the IDEA grant for basic and preschool funds. And that is all of the Operations, questions, anything? So I make a motion to approve operations committee items L1 through L16 as recommended. Do I have a second? Second. Anyone have, have any comments or questions? 
Uh, if not, if you can call the roll, please. Sure. Yeah. Key? Yes. Trace? Yes. Bellas? Yes. Cunningham? Yes, but abstain from L15. Noted. Doherty? Yes. Fergoso? Yes, but I need to abstain from the IT share services from the LC. Noted. And the list one inch. And Brick? Yes. Motion carries. All right, uh, moving on to old business. Anyone have any old business? Michelle, I know you always have everything, so go ahead. Yeah, I just, well, especially with now that we have pretty much have solidified the board and we were trying last year to get a board retreat, but the board goals, we don't have any goals. So I was hoping that we might be able to start pursuing that again this year. See if there's um, a possibility for us to come up with goals for the board. Okay. Is that something you want to put together? Well, isn't that usually our NJSB in person? I was going to suggest that, but she wasn't here this evening. So. Okay. Well, we can reach out to her. Sure. So, uh, you want information from NJSBA as far as uh, setting up a board retreat? Yeah, to see when there might be availability. Okay. I know you mentioned you weren't happy with them, so I wasn't sure if you wanted to use them or. Well, I think when we looked. I don't know what other options are, are available besides uh, school boards. I mean, there's no other associations, is there, Troy? We kind of got the only game in town. So. But uh, yeah, we can look into that. Um, any other old business? Anyone? Um, <clears throat> I have some old business regarding uh, some discussions that we've had uh, over the past several months regarding um, remote meeting attendance. Uh, it came to fruition this evening. Uh, Mrs. Caselli had reached out to me uh, to make me aware that she was ill and uh, to explore the opportunity of her attendance uh, virtually. Um, I spoke to Trish about it and it came to our attention that we don't have a policy uh, regarding uh, uh, virtual attendance by individual members. So with that, I'd like the policy committee to, uh, to review, uh, I believe it's policy. I don't remember the number. Do you remember the number, Trish? They have a policy. It's there nine. Is a policy that's the no, it's a separate no, policy that we, that we don't have we don't uh, regarding. Uh, they'll give us a baseline for that um, okay. moving forward so that uh, we have something in place um, to reference uh, if these situations continue to arise. Um, so if it's possible that we policy can make to do that and maybe report to us on our February meeting, I'd appreciate that. Um, well, here, I mean, here's the, the flying the ointment. We don't have a policy, committee, policy committee, committee scheduled meeting. and I haven't received this trial assessment alert. So we, we've done the work with our wellness check. So at this point, it's a schedule on an as needed basis. Um, again, I haven't received this trial assessment alert for us to review anything. Um, well, let me ask the policy committee. Uh, you prefer to review it on a committee level and report back, or should we just move it to a full board discussion in February? Well, I don't know if you want my opinion. I mean, it just I would think it would need to be a full board discussion of whether it goes to review. Um, meaning, how does people feel about that? About what? about actually reviewing a policy. I mean, are members in favor of reviewing a policy? Or are they not? Like, I, I think we got to start square one. And that's, again, up, up, up to you guys, but I'm just procedurally. Is there a state policy on this at all? <coughs> Is there a state policy on this at all? School boards has a policy. I do believe Australia Sesame may have a sample policy. So um, there's policies out there, sure. Yeah, uh, Trish actually sent me the policy. The the draft policy, not draft, but a format policy today. So I think regardless, we need to have a policy one way or the other um, to avoid a situation like this where something comes up and we don't have a policy. So, so would this be for any time in five years from now and COVID, like COVID, no COVID, if I have the flu, if I have strep throat, if I, if I don't have a babysitter, I can come virtual? Like if this well, that's part, of, this, that's part of the policy that we would be discussing. Okay. So. The, the policy would outline those type of situations. So we're not sitting here guessing as to what's permitted or what's not. So, so does anyone object to looking at the policy? Yeah. 
Okay. So you're, you'd rather uh, every board at every meeting, uh, depending on the attendance, vote on whether or not they're going to permit it? I mean, we've done that forever and ever and ever and ever. No more meetings in person. I think we've also done virtual, though. No, no, no. What, what I'm saying is right now there's no policy in place. So depending on who's sitting here, you could change that at every meeting. You, you'll prefer that to having a policy? If I could just clarify, I think the term we're being mixed up policy that he had referenced was for a remote or virtual meeting during a pandemic and or emergency. The, the policy that we were recommending to put the place or just found as the um, draft was for board members to attend meetings via electronic devices, whether it be a speakerphone um, or a Google Meet or Zoom, something to that effect, uh, but more so just either with an audio device to be able to attend. So there, there is a difference. Um, virtual meetings and remote meetings would have to be advertised and accessible to the public as well. This portion would just be applicable to the board member themselves and, and the way the board wishes to allow them to attend. Right, right yes, now you have no, no policy on it at all, so you can't allow somebody to participate by phone. So I guess the question, Troy, was saying is do you want to even consider opening the door to allowing people to not show up personally? If you do, then take a look at the policy. If you don't, then you stick with the fact that people have to show up for meetings. So, sorry if I wasn't clear on what the policy was I was referring to. So, is there a desire to review the policy? Does anyone object to reviewing the policy? I mean, I don't have a desire to know. So you object to review? Yeah, if, the, if the existing policy doesn't say that, then I think we need to revisit, revise, whatever. The problem is currently we don't have a policy period. Okay. We have a policy that deals with virtual meetings during states of emergency. Yeah. We, we do not, it's, it's commonplace, um, we'll take you back pre-pandemic, it was commonplace for members, not at this particular body, but members of governing bodies to uh, have members attend via telephone. I've seen it done in many times, different governmental bodies, uh, even some organizations I've been part of. So the policy that I'm referencing, that, which came to fruition this evening, because we had a board member that was out because of COVID that wished to participate in this evening's meeting. However, we do not have a policy specifically that outlines the procedure for that to occur. Um, so that is the policy that I'm, that I'm referencing. I think we need to have a policy that would do that. Okay. So I think there's a majority that agrees that we should review the policy, correct? So you want to make that a full board discussion, I guess, since the policy committee? You, you guys tell me. I mean, we yeah. can provide sample policies with the weekly update and then for discussion at the next meeting. Is that, is that a path? That okay. Sure. You yeah. guys let, let us know. We'll, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Right. We'll wrap this up. Uh, anyone else have anything for old business? No. Um, anything for new business before we get into the uh, budget update? Uh, Trish, I guess no one has anything, so if you want to go ahead.
employer here to give a verbal update and then schedule for the January work session and or regular meeting. Key dates for this budget, uh, Tuesday, February 22nd is the governor's address. That's the fourth Tuesday in February for statute every year. Thursday, February 24th, the state aid notices will be available, which is two days later, which again is for statute. Uh, so far, expenditure items covered within the budget. Uh, it's not copy and paste. Our budgets are typically a zero-based budget. Uh, health insurance is a big ticket item. I do not have a renewal rate yet as the shift which we participated in did not have a January meeting. Typically, their renewal rates are uh, available in February, so I'll have more information to come. Uh, 11 teaching staff members will be eligible for family benefits in 22-23, and three support staff members will be eligible for family benefits in 22-23. About a $24,000 increase for the single to family benefit plans. So that total for contingency costs of the increase is about $336,000. Salaries, health benefits, and additional contractual required benefits total about 80% of the total budget. Uh, transportation items are, of course, buses, four, new 54 passenger buses, that totals about $500,000. One new special ed bus is about $100,000. Trish, you know my position on the budget, right? 10%? 10% discount? Yeah. Noted. So noted. Um, on the other side, uh, it's not verbal uh, budget update portion, but the uh, personal financial disclosure forms um, will go out to you via email tonight with those instructions that you have to fill out. If you have any questions, I know the process is slightly confusing. Um, it's not as easy as it was. Um, let me go. Please fill it out. I mess it up every year. And now I see which one I want. Any questions about the budget?
Yeah, again, they're, they're preliminary conversations. Yeah. And when I sat down with each of the uh, supervisors, you know, we have wish lists, we have, hey, this might work, that might work. But, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to, to, to the dollar. So, yes, I mean, your answer, answer your question is yes. You know, right now, then that'll be preliminary. Okay. okay. Um, and the other thing I was, just want to see if, if, I don't know if the rest of the board members, but it's not, obviously not now, but maybe for next month, if we could get an idea of, especially with having new board members, the total amount of ESSR funds we've gotten, what we spent and on what, and what we have left. Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, Michelle, it reminded me, you, the last meeting, that asked for that COVID data. Did you want to well, discuss that at all or make any proposals regarding the quarantining? Well, I mean, obviously from the data that we got, the, the contact tracing that we are doing is, is probably not a procedure or policy that we would implement and follow because it's not working in terms of the fact that So do you think we should discontinue the contact tracing at this point? Yes. Are you making that a motion or? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. There's another district, uh, at least one that I know of, that has done the same thing. That has up in uh, Central New Jersey. That has um, decided to not follow recommendations and to stop contact with them. So, do you want me to make a motion or do you, you like Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I would like to make choice input because, it, it, you know, it's the administration who. Yeah. It does this on a daily, and the nurses understand, you know, the nurses too, obviously, but Absolutely. Um, you're dealing with this day in and day out. Sure, so hopefully you had the opportunity to look at that, that. hopefully it was helpful. Uh, hopefully it gave you a, a picture on how we're logging that, that data in that spreadsheet. Uh, so long story short, you, your, your statements are correct. It's, it's draining, it really is, it drains our resources. Um, the reality of it, I had told Jason this, when we went down to the five days of quarantine, um, when a student or staff really tests positive, there's always a, a two, three, four day lag time anyway in regards to getting the results. So when the nurses are notified that, you know, little Johnny tested positive, well, by the time they look at, you know, the back time, that child who may have been deemed a close contact, they're already three, four days into that five day quarantine. So um, with the recommendation coming out of shrinking that five days, it's certainly shrinking the amount of time the kids are actually spending out of school. Now, the flip side of that, you know, I don't know that, that it, it reduces the amount of time because I do believe we have a responsibility to let the parent know that their child may be sitting at a lunch table with a child that tested positive. Whether that parent wants to keep the child home for the five, 10, what, what have you, um, that's their decision. And ultimately, we would need to know that to help to live stream from the instructional standpoint. So 
two sides to, to this. I think by lowering the, the, you know, the um, quarantine time down to five days, I think it ultimately accomplished what, what you're asking it to, to, to accomplish. And, you know, I mean, as the cases go down, like, you know how hard it was to get a PCR test to, uh, two weeks ago. You know, maybe that lag time shrinks and, and, and then, you, you know, you do see the kids out of school, you know, three days, four days of the five. But, uh, you know, to think it's going to be a full five, it's, it's just not. And again, we, we don't get that, that data real time, you know. So, uh, really, the pleasure of the board. Uh, I mean, I think I think it's already accomplishing what what you wanted it to accomplish. I really do. No, and we do have parents who are on the flip side. So remember, you know, we're 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 here for all the kids. So you do have parents that will notify the you know the the nurses that hey, I'm not comfortable with that five. I'm going to keep them out the full ten, and then we set them up with live stream. So, you know, we're we're just best we can well given all the data that we looked at and the resources <clears throat> that we're expanding uh, I'd like to make a motion that we discontinue uh, the contact tracing Sorry. Uh, is that a roll call Trish does that create any situation where some parent may be in a position where they someone's exposed to illness because there was no contact tracing. Well, I, I think the clarity here, I think the goal that you guys want to accomplish is stop excluding students from school if they're deemed a close contact here at school. Not the quote unquote contact tracing, because like I said, we still have the responsibility to let that parent know that a child was sitting at that table. What they want to do with that information, that's that's their choice. So I think making a motion to do away with contact tracing is is probably not the clear path. Like if you want to stop excluding students, like requiring them to stay out. So if we call a parent and say, hey, your child is sitting across the, across the lunch table, they don't have to stay home from school, but if you want to keep them home from school, just to monitor whether they have symptoms, I think. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's what you're looking to accomplish. Because, to, you know, we. We, we can't do away with, with contact tracing because ultimately if someone does want to stay home and, and receive live streaming, receive you know, virtual instruction because they're deemed a close contact, we need to know that, right? So, and we've been limiting that live streaming to, to COVID related issues only. So the principals, they've been doing an amazing job, the nurses, like we still need to know that. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to take the stance to say, okay, um, your child was deep in close contact here at school. Um, you can keep them home for the five days, ten days, or not. That's that's your choice. Yeah, I don't think I'm disagreeable to that. I mean, at some point, the contact tracing has to end. Do you agree? Like, I mean, we're not going to contact trace COVID for now to infinity. I wouldn't think. No, and and you know, I think you'll see that recommendation come down right. the line. But you know, certainly looking at statewide data where it is now. I would never recommend that. Right. So for clarification, um, it's to uh, modify our current uh, position on requiring quarantining uh, due to contact tracing as opposed to not requiring, correct? Oh, this uh, is close contact. Close school, contact. Not the household right. close contact. You can look at the data. The household contact dominates the, the, um, the data that I sent you as far as the, you know, the percentages are very high and the percentages of students right. getting it from their siblings is high. Yeah, so just to clarify, we're not excluding anyone from partaking in the, the virtual option should they be in a quarantine situation. Right. COVID, yeah, that might COVID related right. all. Right. That, that, that's where we are. And we're right. still going to continue that. That's not going to change. And it wouldn't change <clears throat> parents being notified that their child may have been exposed. Correct. So the only change would be the, uh, a, a required quarantine period from a school close contact. So we're all clear on that? So if we have a healthy child that was in close contact by a school nurse calling us, we can keep that child home for still some of the school without testing? Correct. It would, it would give the parent the option, right? So, all right. That's not, that's not what the medical professionals are recommending, just to be clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, you want to call it a roll, please, sir? Bellas? Yes. 
Cunningham? Yes. Doherty? Yes. Fergoso? No. Keen? Yes. Trace? No. Brand? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Uh, anything else for new business? Or? Um, we have our second public comment portion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to open to the public at 9 o'clock. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, we are open to the public if anyone would like to comment at this time. <coughs> Mrs. Doyle? Yeah, from our, oh God, I'm sorry. Is anyone else from the public like to be heard? Uh, if not, I make a motion to close to the public. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, abstentions. Um, from, a, from a procedural uh, standpoint, uh, Mr. Walton, um, I'm assuming the administration will be reaching out to Mrs. Doyle uh, to get her squared away for a, uh, and yeah. that we'll have her seated at the February meeting. Yep, yes, Mrs. Murphy, and we'll okay. be in touch and do the fingerprint process. Uh, is there any other questions or comments? If not, I make a motion. We adjourn at 9.01. Second. All in favor? Please.